halfway through the evening, I turned to the lady in question and I said to her, oh, I hear you, you study postmodernism. She said, yes. I said, there are no universal truths, yes? Of course, other than the one universal truth that yes, there are no, uh, no yes, yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah, so she said, yes, yes, no absolute truths. I said, well, do you mind if I propose what I consider to be universal truth and then we can discuss, you could tell me how I might be wrong. She says, yes, go for it. I said, is it not a universal truth? Now this is 2002, so it's way before the transgender stuff of men can have children mm -hmm. and men can menstruate and so on. So I, so I said, is it not true that within Homo sapiens, only women bear children? Is that not a fact that we can take to the bank? It's settled. She looked at me completely perplexed by my stupidity and said, no, it's not true. I said, it's not true that only women bear children. How so? She said, well, because there is some Japanese tribe of some Japanese island where within their folkloric realm, and myth mythological realm, it is the men who bear children. So, you know, by you restricting the conversation to the biological realm, that's how you keep us, you know, barefoot and pregnant. The following is a conversation with Professor Gad Saad. Professor Gad Saad is a distinguished professor of marketing at the John Molson School of Business, Concordia University. He is a world-renowned expert in evolutionary psychology and consumer behavior. He is author of several influential books, such as The Consuming Instinct, The Evolutionary Basis of Consumption, and The Parasitic Mind. In this conversation, we discussed maladaptive beliefs and their impact on society, and we also explore the unique role Israel has in the anti-PC battle. It was a mind-blowing conversation, and I must say, personally, I learned a lot from it. Hi and welcome to my channel. My name is Dr. Roy Yosevich and in this channel I speak with the most interesting people from all around the world discussing science, philosophy, artificial intelligence and more. If you find this talk interesting, please consider subscribing, hit the bell button and be part of this great community. And now, without further ado, Professor Gad Saad. Professor Gad Saad, thank you so much for coming. How are you today? Oh, I'm very excited to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. I waited for this interview, I think, for over two years. And finally, <laughs> my privilege and great honor speaking with you about your latest book, The Parasitic Mind. But in, I think, three months, you're going to publish another book, Happiness, The Sad Truth About Happiness. So and because I didn't have the opportunity to read uh, Happiness, we are going to focus on uh, the parasitic mind, okay? Sure, perfect. Now, before I start, let me, I, I must say that your book is brilliant and it is both scientific and very personal. Your childhood story at, at, at the beginning is very emotional. My grandmother told a different story where she, uh, she escaped Libya during World War II and their Arab neighbors and friends just hunted them. So it was a slightly different, but basically the gist is basically the same. Now, I don't want to go over uh, too much, you know, to, to give an introduction. So I asked chat GPT or GPT-4 to summarize your book in 100 words. So I will read it aloud and please tell me if you find this summary <laughs> plausible, okay? Okay, go. Okay, so, you know, and I will let everyone to uh, also read it, okay? So it's going to be like this. In parasitic mind, God said an evolutionary psychologist explores the determinal impact of ideas path pathogens on Western society. He argue that these ideas pathogens, which originate from academia institutions and infiltrate mainstream culture, undermine logic, reason, and scientific inquiry. Saad asserted that those dangerous ideas, including postmodernism, radical feminism, and identity politics, have led to culture of victimhood, Stephen Spears' free speech, and the erosion of traditional value. Drawing on his background in evolutionary psychology, Saad offers insight into the human mind's susceptibility to those idea pathogens and proposed ways to strengthen intellectual immunity by encouraging critical thinking, open dialogue, and commitment to truth. Sad advocate for the preservation of intellectual freedom and the defense of reason against the onslaught of parasitic ideas. What do you think? It's it's gorgeous. <laughs> it's 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 right on. I'm uh, 
I mean, you know, I first studied AI in 1985. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I have always thought that the promise of AI had not been met. But reading that summary, maybe I was wrong. Uh, okay. So this is basically the idea. Very good. Yeah. Uh, I, by the way, I also read the book. So I, I didn't just summarize it. Right. Okay. But uh, one thing, and I think that this is very, very important, is the idea, and I want again to quote from your book, there are two fundamental ethical orientations that guide people's daily behaviors, the ontological and consequential and ethics. The former is an ab absolutist view of ethical standard. It is never correct to lie, like Immanuel Kant, whereas the latter evaluates the ethical merits of an action based on its consequences. It is at time acceptable to lie to spare someone's feeling. The reality is that most people operate under both systems. I married, you're married. We know exactly what consequential ethic is. But my question is, is it forbidden or bad to use consequential ethics in the world of science always? Right. Uh, so it depends. Yeah, that's a great opening question. Uh, interestingly, just uh, the past few months, I've given two talks, one at Stanford, the other one at USC, precisely on that distinction, on the deontological versus consequentialist. When it comes to certain principles in science, you absolutely have to be deontological. That's my point. So when it comes to the pursuit of truth, here is what often some people do. Well, yes, you should pursue truth, but if there are downstream effects that might be negative, then maybe you shouldn't pursue that truth or you should stifle that truth. No, because that's a very slippery slope, right? But you know, by that logic, we should have never done research in physics because research in physics led to the dropping of the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So the list of possible downstream negative effects is infinite, it's endless. So my perspective is no, I don't, not I don't care, but it's not my job to worry about the, whether the research that I will do will be misused by someone in the future. It might hurt someone's feelings. What if we're studying sex differences and one group might be hurt if we find that one sex does better at this task than the other sex? Or what if it's two races we're studying? And so no, when it comes to deontological principles in science, they must be adhered to. But the physicist worked for the Manhattan Project, you know, the atomic bomb for uh, under Hiroshima and Nagasaki, said that this is this was exactly the world that they were giving. You know, you do the science, we we will carry on the consequences. And then aftermath, they felt very bad. Now today, this evening is a Holocaust Day in Israel. Okay, and we let's just you know talk about eugenics. The idea is that it is very hard to say, mm, maybe we should explore eugenics, okay? Because who knows? But we know what happened when we study eugenics. Now, the other side of the coin is what Richard Heyer told me, that the, that the NSA, I think, you know, that the National American Fund for Ac Academic Grant, I forgot uh, the name, said that it oh, is- NSF. The NSF. NSF. NSF said, you can't do any research that will, uh, that will show physiological differences between men and women. And Richard Heyer, which is the editor of Intelligence, said, listen, Alzheimer evolved differently in men and women. And if we don't investigate this, we can't have good medicine for men and women. So we have two sides of the coin. What do you think? Well, so eugenics, though, has a policy implication, right? So it's not just the pursuit of science for its for the sheer purity of pursuing science. So there we could potentially apply a consequentialist ethic. But to the second example, of course, that's exactly what I'm warning against. As, as an evolutionary psychologist, so I'm for, for your listeners who, who don't know about my academic work, uh, my entire career has been trying to Darwinize the business school. The idea being that you can't 
study employer behavior, employee behavior, consumer behavior, without understanding the evolutionary biological underpinnings that make us do the things that we do in the marketplace, right? So you can't study economic decision-making or consumer decision-making void of an understanding of biological principles. Well, to many of my colleagues, that was complete lunacy, right? Well, how could you study that? That's dangerous. That's that's Nazi quack science, right? So no, let's discuss things using epistemological standards without worrying about whether it's there are dangerous conse consequences down downstream. I'll, I'll, be, I'll give you a great example. At one point, I had sent a paper, which was subsequently published elsewhere, to a top psychology journal where I was studying sex differences in uh, mate choice. How much information do men and women acquire before they either choose a mate or reject mates. And of course, from evolutionary theory, we know that it makes perfect evolutionary sense for women to be more choosy because the minimal obligatory parental investment that women can bear by making a wrong mate choice looms much larger than it does for men. And so using those principles, I was demonstrating certain sex differences in mate search. The One of the reviewers said, what is the point of studying sex differences. Why are you trying to marginalize and pit one group against another? Now imagine how insane that is. We're a sexually reproducing species that has sexual dimorphism to the point of, uh, what was who was the person who you said was studying Alzheimer's? Uh, Richard Heyer, Professor Richard Heyer. Okay, exactly. So we have sexual dimorphisms. It's, it's part of the innate biological classification of humans to recognize that men and women are very similar on many things, but very different on other things, precisely for evolutionary reasons. And yet this otherwise supposedly smart academic was saying, this is horrible. You are pitting men against women. Why don't you study things that transcend sex differences? So again, to, to, to your first point, Truth has to be pursued deontologically, period. But you need to be, uh, who need to be responsible, okay? So I, I will address it differently. Who need to be responsible to the outcome, to the result of your scientific inquiry? Is it society or you as a scientist? Well, I don't think it's me as a scientist because it's very, very hard to predict the infinite number of ways that something could be used, used positively or negatively downstream. Mm -hmm. So let me let me draw an analogy. Uh, Fermat, I mean, in French, you say Fermat, F-E-R-M-A-T, was a famous number theory several hundred years ago, whose work, and as you may remember, or some of your viewers know, Fermat's last theorem was only... Uh, proven about 20 years ago by Andrew Wiles at, of Princeton. Well, Fermat had, uh, you know, uh, discovered all sorts of, uh, pr you know, had proven a whole bunch of theorems and so on that for 300 years has sat had sat there collecting dust with absolutely no applicability, right? And yet, I would have been strongly in support of him doing that research because you just do it for pure reasons. So in this case, I'm not talking about nefarious consequences. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about, should I do research if it has applications or not? Well, when cryptography came along, some of Fermat's theorems that for 300 mm -hmm. years had laid dormant collecting dust suddenly became relevant and applicable. So again, the more general point is my, what I, the oath that I you know, swear to, just like the Hippocratic Oath is do no harm. For me, it's pursue truth, unencumbered by any other constraints, and then let the chips fall where they may. And it's not because I don't care about negative consequences, but it's because it becomes very, very difficult to not succumb to the slippery slope, because then someone says, well, if you study sex differences, this is very dangerous. Women will be hurt if you say that men are stronger than them and so on definitely again i would like to point out that let the chips fall where they fall we want we prefer to do it in a moral society so the ontological truth or the ontological ethics must strive or, or must flourish or can be flourish only in moral society where yes. where society take responsibility for the outcomes of the scientific discoveries okay sure 
Sure. Okay. Now, another thing, uh, in a recent podcast, you called Michel Foucault and, Dar and Darida, two of the fathers of postmodern theory, a group of French imbeciles. Now, imbecile is a, is a technical word for stupid in, uh, in English. And in your book, you say the following uh, thing. In a conversation with the American philosopher John Searle, Foucault confessed to this Fox profundity, the idea that they speak with a technical jargon. In France, you got to have 10% incomprehensible, incomprehensible. Otherwise, people will not think it's deep. They won't think you are a profound thinker, which leads me to the Sokal hoax. The idea is that in order to be profound, you need to be misunderstood. And my question is, is there any merits to the theory of Foucault? I would say, I would argue that there are some merit if you distinguish between humanities and science. If you go to the science, we need to go for the absolute truth. But in the humanities, truth, it is, you know, a, a matter of perspective. Would you argue, uh, would you agree? Uh, so it depends which elements of whether you refer to Foucault or Derrida or Lacan. Uh, look, so one of the reasons why I was arguing the stuff that you, you read in that book is that I'm arguing there that postmodernism of all of the idea pathogens, of all of the parasitic ideas that I discuss in, in the book, what I call the granddaddy of all idea pathogens is postmodernism be because it's the most dangerous one in that it doesn't offer uh, an epistemological possibility of getting at the truth to go back to our earlier conversation, right? If everything is uh, constrained by subjectivity, if everything is constrained by, you know, relativism, then to speak of an absolute truth is is nonsense according to the postmodernists. So it's not so much specific elements of what Foucault might have said about the penal system, whether I agree with it or not. It's the more it's the more general bent that everything is constrained by relative relativity, not in the Einsteinian sense, but in the in the you know who are we to judge who's right, who's wrong. Now I tell two, one story, which if you'll allow me, it, it might be worth repeating for your audience. I tell a story that I faced in 2002 when one of my former doctoral students had just, had just defended his doctoral dissertation and we were supposed to go out to celebrate dinner. Are, are you familiar? Do you know the story that I'm about to say? Or No, or no, no, no. Okay, good. No, so I'm, no. glad, I'm, I'm okay. glad that it's the first time you're hearing it. Okay. okay. So, uh, so we were going out to dinner. It was myself, my wife, uh, my daughter doctoral student who had just finished his PhD, and he was bringing along a date, a, a, a lady friend. And so he called me up a couple of hours before the, the dinner to say, hey, I just wanted to give you a heads up that the, the, the person that I'm bringing for the dinner, she's a graduate student in uh, postmodernism, women's studies, and cultural anthropology. To it's which... going to be an interesting dinner. <laughs> it's going to be an interesting dinner. So I understood that to mean, hey, let's... Uh, you know, let's keep it nice. Let's keep it civil, which which I always do. I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, a an unnecessarily mean person. So I said, yeah, yeah, don't worry. I got it. My mouth, <laughs> mom is the word. I'm going to be on my best behavior, which, of course, was a complete abject lie. And so about halfway through the evening, I turned to the lady in question and I said to her, oh, I hear you. You study postmodernism. She said, yes. I said, there are no universal truths, yes? Of course, other than the one universal truth that yes, there are no, no yes, yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah, so she said, yes, yes, no absolute truths. I said, well, do you mind if I propose what I consider to be universal truth, and then we can discuss, you could tell me how I might be wrong? She says, yes, go for it. I said, is it not a universal truth? Now, this is 2002, so it's way before the transgender stuff of men can have children mm -hmm. and men can menstruate and so on. So I, so I said, is it not true that within Homo sapiens, only women bear children? Is that not a fact that we can take to the bank? It's settled. She looked at me completely perplexed by my stupidity and said, no, it's not true. I said, it's not true that only women bear children. How so? She said, well, because there is some Japanese tribe of some Japanese island where within their folkloric realm, 
and myth mythological realm, it is the men who bear children. So, you know, by you restricting the conversation to the biological realm, that's how you keep us, you know, barefoot and pregnant. So once I recovered from the mini stroke that I had at facing her stupidity, I said, okay, maybe then it's it's maybe too controversial. It, maybe it's too corrosive to discuss such a difficult example like only women bear children. So let me take a less corrosive example. Is it not true since time immemorial that sailors have relied on the premise that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west? So there she used Jacques Derrida's deconstructionism. Language creates reality. And she said, what do you mean by east and west? And what do you mean by the sun? That which you call the sun, I might call, these are literally her words, I might call dancing hyena. I said, well, fine, the dancing hyena rises in the east and <laughs> sets in the west. And then she said, I don't play those label games. Now, why do I repeat the story over and over again? Because it perfectly captures the cancerous Darwinian dead end of postmodernism. If an otherwise supposedly intelligent graduate student at a leading university sits down with me and we can't agree on the two fundamental facts that only women bear children and that there is such a thing as East and West and the sun, you know, the star called the sun, well, then where do we go from there? Then there's going to be a complete bifurcation in our ability to have any meaningful conversation. So this is why in that section that you refer to when I'm talking about the Foucault versus Cyril thing, I, I call them intellectual terrorists because they're akin to terrorists because they're blowing up our shared understanding of common meaning. My my daughter is is a twelve is twelve year old and 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 she addresses herself as an anti feminist. Okay, because we live in a very anti feminist uh, family, and she has a meme say, "Did you just assume a gender? This is very offensive." So it's like <laughs> a meme in our day. This is just assume a gender. It's very offensive. Very okay, good. We, we, without further ado, let's move on to the more uh, uh, to the harder harder questions. Uh, okay. The one thing that I want to add with is the topic of maladaptive beliefs or maladaptive positions. Now, according to basically, I would say that your recent book addressed those kinds of beliefs or, or positions that they are maladaptive. Now, according to evolutionary psychology, maladaptive beliefs will be extinct because they are maladaptive. And first and for, foremost, the number one evolutionary enemy is not having children. So we can take abortion, for example, you know, the the uh, the fight for the right to have abortion. Now, you can make it, you, you have poor life and poor choices arguments, but it seems that the, the, the fight is much more emotional. And my question is, would you, uh, would you say that the concept of, for example, a double income, no kids, or even very small family is against evolution? Wow, that's a great question. Uh... So there are several ways that I can tackle that. So let me first uh, link it to actually some of my earlier books. So in the this book right here, The Evolutionary Basis of Consumption, and uh, this book right here, The Consuming Instinct, I have, a, I have chapters where I talk about uh, the evolutionary roots of dark side consumption. Dark side consum consumption are phenomena like pornographic addiction, pathological gambling, eating disorders, compulsive buying, excessive sun tanning. Now, why am I mentioning those? Because those are maladaptive behaviors. If we are adaptive creatures, why is it that it is so easy for us to succumb to these temptations? And what I explain in, in those books is that the, the evolutionary way that you explain maladaptive behaviors in many cases, it's because it's a adaptive mechanism that misfires that for example, can become hyperactive. So in the case of let's say OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Well, obsessive compulsive disorder, when it is within some regulated normal range makes perfect adaptive sense. We should scan the environment for environmental threats. It should make sense that I'm afraid to have germ contamination. If somebody sneezes in their hand and then comes to shake my hand, I'm really concerned. I want to wash my hands after. I want to go check that the back door in my house is locked. The problem with OCD 
irrespective of the form of obsession of, or compulsion. This is a great that... point. Just a great point. You know, the, the adaptive belief that explodes or, take, exactly. or getting out of proportion. It's like exactly. cancer. Exactly. This is a great point. That, thank you. So what I'm arguing there is that it is misfiring. So let's specifically look at the neuronal level of what happens with OCD. Mm -hmm. So there is a flag that rises that says, please check environmental threat. So for people who don't suffer from OCD, they tend to that threat. The flag goes down and I go on with my day. That's perfectly adaptive. What happens to the OCD sufferer is that the second that they attend to that threat, the flag goes down, then the, the flag goes back up. Now I'm stuck in an infinite loop of doubt so that I spend eight hours in front of the faucet cleaning my hands with scalding hot water. I don't go to work because I'm too busy spending seven hours cleaning my hands. The skin is falling off my fingers. So, so to your more general point is that there are many things that humans succumb to that are maladaptive, but are perfectly within the rubric of evolutionary theory. So we, we have the survival mechanism, even though suicide exists. We are a sexually reproducing species, even though homosexuality has not been selected out. And even though Catholic priests supposedly, I say supposedly because some of them violated, <laughs> take the oath of celibacy. So the fact that you have manifestations of maladaptive behaviors doesn't serve to bring down the edifice of Darwin. As a matter of fact, it is perfectly consistent with evolutionary theory. I hope that I've answered oh, your yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, but this is great. And then we came back to your book, uh, The Parasitic Mind, about the idea of pathogens. And this is maladaptive belief. And I can say, you know, I, I would like to, with your permission, distinguish between OCD, sure. which has no physiological, no neurological roots, uh, traces, and no kids, which has, I would say, with, which is much more cultural oriented uh, decision. But then again, it doesn't matter because we have those bad ideas that spread out throughout society. So yes. could you please just point to the evolutionary mechanism of not having kids? Because yes. again, it, it, it seems like from the economic perspective, I can explain. Kids were, were here to help me go through a uh, you know, the old years, now the government takes care, everything is good. I don't need to have kids. Yes. But from the evolutionary perspective, I would like to hear your point on that. Yes. Uh, you ready? I'm about to blow your mind. Get ready. Put on okay. your seatbelt. So uh, in, in evolutionary theory, there's the principle of inclusive fitness. Fitness doesn't mean fitness in the way that you kindly told me before we started the show that I look trim and fit now. It doesn't mean athletic fitness. It's... Uh, it's fitness in the currency of evolutionary theory means extending and propagating my genes, right? Survival now, of the fittest. Right, so, right, exactly. But survival of the fittest, of course, as many of your followers might not be aware of, doesn't it's, mean- It's Spencer, it's and, and it's not it's Darwin. Spencer, exactly, exactly. It's yes, not Darwin. Very, definitely. Very, very good. So uh, inclusive fitness means that there are several pathways by which I can inc increase- my fitness, my my the currency of propagating my genes. I can do it directly through reproductive fitness, which speaks to your point. The more kids I have, the the more my genes will spread. Since on average, my children share share half their genes with me. Of course, if I have no children, to your point, that seems like it's a Darwinian dead end. It can't make sense. But this is why now we're going to get to inclusive fitness. There is the rip. There is a direct reproductive fitness, but then there is the indirect reproductive fitness through the mechanism of kin selection, meaning that I'm also increasing the propagation of my genes by investing in my nephews and in my nieces. So there are still ways by which I can be successful, biologically speaking, even though I shut off my reproductive fitness. By the way, the explanation that I just gave is exactly the explanation that evolutionists have used to explain why homosexuality has not been selected out, 
right? So they use a kin selection argument for the persistence of homosexuality as a possible behavioral repertoire of the human condition, right? Now, the, the data, though, has not necessarily supported the kin selection argument for homosexuality, but that's how I would answer your question. I can still decide to shut off my reproduction and yet invest heavily in my nieces and nephews, and I could still come out a winner in the biological game. Do you follow? Your, your gay uncle is your, is your coolest uncle. This is where it's exactly basically- Exactly right. Exactly. Now, the reason why the data doesn't support it, although I don't necessarily agree that that was the best test of the theory, is that they've actually tested it by doing exactly what you just said, which is you take at a given level of kin relationship, let's say the gay uncle and the heterosexual uncle, and if the theory is supposedly correct, then you should expect that on average, your gay uncle to invest more in you, you meaning the nephew or the yes. niece, than your straight uncle. But then I argue that, that's not necessarily the best measure of investment, mm -hmm. right? The fact that he, that the gay uncle should spend more on your, uh, you know, your birthday might not be the most biologically mm -hmm. relevant way to test investment. So that's still up okay. for debate, but that's how I would answer it. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Now, another maladaptive belief, of course, socialism, yes? Now, it's been completely scientifically disproven. And, yes. and 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 but nevertheless it's, it's like the finish it is, it is keep rising keep resurfacing under different name woke the new marxism progressive and my question is regarding evolutionary psychology what psychological instincts within the human nature socialism addresses right so here that's great by the way and and to your point about trying to link socialism i always look at the time i i'm, I'm terrified from the clock <laughs> oh no, thank you. No, if, 15 if, minutes if, if we need, if we need to go a few minutes extra don't worry okay. about it because uh you know I it is want... very interesting <laughs> yeah okay thank you uh on your on your yes. attempt to link evolutionary theory to socialism eo wilson who for your listeners and viewers who may not know him he regrettably he recently passed away he's a, a evolutionary biologist uh from harvard who's written many books for the general public, uh, his, his area of expertise was social ants. And social ants, as you may know, really are, in a sense, the almost perfect communist society because you've got the reproductive queen and then you have innumerable equal worker ants, right? They're indistinguishable, right? So when he was asked about Marxism, E.O. Wilson answered, good ideology, wrong species, which is one of my favorite quotes from a scientist because it's so pithy, economical, and yet perfectly describes it, which is socialism is a great idea, just not for humans. But you, but to your point, so then why does it seem so alluring? Because remember, you go ahead. Yeah, just a second. It, it, it is so true that many people don't consider ants, you know, many people con consider consider the, the entire colony to be one creature, okay? So it's not many ants, it's just one creature. The concept right. of the individual is what blowing socialism apart. Yes, please continue. Yeah, exactly. So so if, if, you, if you look at uh, human societies, there is a tension between the fact that we are, we do create dominance hierarchies, right? Uh, while we may all love to be equal under the law, we're not equal in our potentiality, right? We weren't all born with the equal likelihood of becoming Lionel Messi, even though social constructivism would like us to think that that is true. Every one of our children could be the next Michael Jordan. Every one of our children could be the next Lionel Messi or Albert Einstein. So that's a very hopeful message. It's a lovely message, but it's perfectly nonsensical. So there is a tension between... I think it's a toxic message. If you have it kids, is a toxic message. I, I, if you have like a short kid and he, you know, have like a Michael Jordan poster and say, if you walk hard and you can you can be Michael Jordan, this is just the... the, the, the this is mean. Right, exactly. This is mean. 
Exactly. That you're exactly right. But it is rooted, as I explained, the parasitic mind in an original noble goal, which is would it don't you want to provide everybody with the endless hope of they can be whatever they can? No, I'm a realist. I'd rather navigate in the real world rather than in some utopia. But to come back to your question about socialism and its you know its, its evolutionary links. So on the one hand, we are dominance higher. We we seek dominance hierarchies. Some of us are taller, shorter. Uh, harder working, less hard working, more intelligent, less intelligent. And then you'd expect that through a competitive process, we will assort. Some of us will become leaders. Others will be followers. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if you look in, on, in certain hunter gatherer societies that, that mimic our evolutionary past, they are quite egalitarian in their bent, but not because that is the natural inclination but it's because it actually serves as a pacifying mechanism in that particular ecosystem, okay? So what ends up happening with socialism is in a very naive way, wouldn't it be nice if we all held hand and sang John Lennon's song, Imagine, where we eradicate this evil capitalistic hierarchy where some of us have more money than others? Well, when you're dumb and young, that's why you get parasitized by socialism. But most people then grow out of their youthful stupidity and realize that that's not how the world works. And so that's why it keeps resurfacing because it is really part of the utopian of the idiotic youth to say, revolution, we should all be equal. And then we grow out of it. So socialism sounds great when I'm young, but it is perfectly antithetical to our human nature. I want to strengthen this argument with something from Jewish tradition that I don't know if you're familiar with. And if you're not, uh, please uh, yes. uh, use it in your future lectures. Maimonides, which was one of the greatest thinkers of, uh, Love him. of the Middle Ages. I teach the Guide for the Perplexed for the last three years. Okay, So I, I, I really invested in Maimonides in, in his book, Eight Chapters which was written when he was 23, he said, basically, if you work hard, you can be like Moses, the prophet like Moses. You can have the values of Moses. It's just about you being working hard. And later on in Mishneh Torah, when he was 40, he said, no. He looked around, he said, just a second, not everyone is Maimonides. Wow. Not everyone. He said, some attributes of your, some virtues or some attributes of, of your psyche will permit you, will stop you from being Moses. If you are in your essence, you're an angry man, you will not get to be a prophet. And this was like a transition when he became older, you know, and, and, and sold the world. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, that shows you, by the way, that he had epistemic humility, which basically means that he was humble enough to change his position as a result of incoming information, which by definition is the hallmark of a great mind, right? Because most people, once they're anchored in the position, nothing is going to move me from my position. I'm right because I'm right because I'm right. So great kudos to him. Two stories that I think you would appreciate about uh, Maimonides. Uh, one comes from this book and one comes from uh, the forthcoming book that you kindly mentioned. About happiness. About happiness. So let me start with the La, the forthcoming book so I, in the i have an epigraph so the the opening quote of a chapter in one of the chapters where i'm talking about the old ancient greek maxim of you know everything in moderation which which aristotle had talked about the golden mean right the the, the soldier who is too cowardly is not good the soldier who is too reckless in his courage will die he's not good somewhere in the middle is the golden mean well maimonides has a very very similar uh which i'm sure you know of yes. very similar quote which i use in the epigraph of that chapter so that's maimonides story number one now, here's another one that's going to, I think you're going to really be excited by. Uh, in the Paris, in the evolutionary basis of consumption, I, I at one point I'm talking about philanthropy as a costly signal, right? So acts of great generosity that serve as a costly signal. Now, in biology, what a costly signal means is that for a signal to be diagnostic, the, the, the emitter of the signal has to it has to carry a cost for him. Otherwise, everybody you need, fake. You need to put your tattoos over here 
where no shield is covering your tattoo. Very good. It's, tattoo exactly here right. is much less signaling than tattoo over here. <laughs> Exactly right. Very, okay. very good point. Right. And actually, I think that there is a paper that looks at tattoos as a costly signal. So your, your intuition is exactly right. Now, as I was talking about philanthropy as a costly signal, I then in, in that section, I discuss the eight levels of tzedakah that Maimonides talks about. And even though he did not couch it in the language of evolutionary theory, he is a Darwinian being, so he and he is a great mind. And so let me explain what, what he talked about, which I'm sure you know. So the highest level of uh, tzedakah, kind of a... a charity, pure... charity. Well, charity. It's not charity. It's, it's exactly. not charity, but, but because charity is something that you don't need to do. Tzedakah comes from the Hebrew word tzedek, justice. You right. must give the charity it is not right. up to you yes please right. continue so the highest level which he recognized is seldom achieved this is incredible it gives me goosebumps just to mention mm -hmm. that a thousand years ago this guy had that insight it's when the receiver of the act and the 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 altruist do not know each other's identity why because then I, so now go back to evolutionary theory, because then I could not get the reputational benefits of doing the act, right? So when you see, for example, it's the, uh, you know, uh, the GAD sad cancer ward at Tel Aviv mm -hmm. University, even though it looks like it's a very charitable act that I did, but guess what? There is vanity in there. It's the GAD sad. It's not the anonymous donation and even when i say that it's anonymous it's really not anonymous because the important billionaires that go to the same party as me they believe know. me i'll be sure to tell them that i they am know. such a good guy but maimonides knew that the only way that you could avoid that hence the highest level is if there's no way for each of the two parties but it goes it. two ways you don't get to you know to brag but the but the guy who were given money don't get to be ashamed and he knew that is a, sh a shame is a destructive force in human life. Okay. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. Now another thing, and wow, we don't uh, uh, Israel. Okay. Yes, Would sir. you say that Israel have any particular role in the in the anti PCO walk battle? And the theory goes like this: Israel is the most politically incorrect country on earth. So people don't like the mere fact that we exist, let alone our unique psyche. We are very confrontational. We are anti-totalitarian. And I might say that this is part of the Jewish tradition of the Jewish heritage from the time of Abraham breaking idol and defile authority. And what would your take would be on the specific roles that Israel has regarding this battle? And I will say that evolutionary psychology as the discipline almost doesn't exist in Israel. So, so we are that's, very anti-PC. That's interesting. So... I don't know. Maybe I'll, I'll turn to your greater expertise about where. So where would you say that Israel ranks on the woke meter? So if 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 you assume that Sweden, Canada historically are the super woke, it, where is Israel? Is it closer to Hungary, which is super anti woke, or is it closer to Canada? We have, I think, no, no, no. It it is closer. If I need to dis, if, if I need to just, you know, you point a gun and say, okay, choose. I would say it will be closer to Hun to Hungary, and and there is a very big battle and debate because what we have here is religion. You know, the Torah said, the Bible said that uh, that, that gay marriage is forbidden, and the ultra orthodox uh, parties in the Knesset in the house of government in Israel say, we don't care about Western society. We don't care about Western value. We have the, we have the values of the Bible. So I think that what the ultra-Orthodox do, and many other people say, we have like a counter, we have a counterbalance again, again walk and again, and again progressivism in, in the light of the Torah or the Bible. So the, the religiosity serves the religiosity, as an inoculation yes. against yes, the woke yes, ideas. Yes, I, I would I would perhaps also argue, and, and then I'll answer your more general yes. question in a second. I would also argue that maybe there is a 
pragmatism that Israelis have to face that cannot allow them to succumb to some of the utopian ideas as easily because you're a very, very small little neighborhood in a much larger neighborhood of super nasty folks. So the the let's hug and love stuff can't quite work in the Middle East. And as you know, I'm from the Middle East. And so I can appreciate that maybe another inoculating factor is just the pragmatic reality of the neighborhood that you live in that doesn't allow you to be as easily parasitized. Does that sound reasonable? I think yes, you know, it, it, it's like we don't have, we don't believe in UFOs in Israel, okay? We, I think that this is part of the thing, you know, Armageddon, Judgment Day, all the, all the big catastrophical Armageddon things only, only happen in, in the US. We have real stuff to worry about. Right. We have, def, I live in Samaria, so this is very dangerous to right. go home and we don't need to invent UFO enemies. We have our own enemies. <laughs> yes, uh, but to your to your more general point, uh, this may or may not be relevant to to your question. Uh, my first semester as a doctoral student, uh, so I studied at Cornell. Uh, I, I don't think he would mind that I mention his name because I don't think, I don't think it's a bad story or anything. So, uh, do you know who Richard Thaler is? Of course. Yeah, okay. So Richard Thaler was my professor at Cornell, which, of course, subsequently he he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, so the first, maybe the first time that I go into his office or one of the first few times I, I had taken a course with him, a, you know, a behavioral decision theory course the first semester, uh, I walk in there and he gets, he says, you know, God, uh, all of the top, you know, behavioral decision theorists, they're all Jewish. And he starts, you know, Herb Simon. Amos Tversky, Dan Daniel Kahneman, Kahneman. Daniel yes. Kahneman. He just, and he goes, don't worry, a good Jewish boy like you, you're going to succeed or something to that effect. <laughs> so, so, you know, there's a real, you know, because often people think that because I'm not someone who's very practicing in my religion, that somehow, you know, I, I've walked away from my Judaism. Nothing could be further from the truth. As a matter of fact, very few people have lived their Judaism as cleanly as I have, I had to put on running shoes and run really fast yes. to avoid the guys who were trying to decapitate me, right? So so I think one can be very, you know, very, very committed to their Jewish heritage uh, without necessarily being very much of a practicing person. I, I don't know if that in any way relates to your question, but I thought I would mention that to your audience. And again, today is a Holocaust day in Israel and uh, Tommy Lapid, the one of, uh, he was a Holocaust survivor and say, I don't need, I, I don't need to define my Judaism, because Hitler did it for me. The yeah. idea is that I can not be a practicing Jew. You know, the the Jewish community or the, or the Jewish, uh, yeah, the Jewish community of Germany before World War II was very, very German. Nevertheless, yeah. there is some something unique about the psyche of the Jewish personas that stood against tyranny in yes. all ages and say, this is bad. You need to be, you need to act differently. And Professor Michel Harsegor told me, he was a very famous historian in Israel, that in the first people, in the, in the communist party, Lenin was the only one who didn't speak Yiddish. Wow, very nice. Can I tell you another very interesting, quick uh, Jewish yes. story that your, your, your followers yes. might enjoy? D this definitely. Is all, this, I discuss it in the parasitic mind, uh, to speak about the jewish mm. obsession with with knowledge so uh so i did an undergrad in mathematics and computer science i, I i'm saying this because it's relevant to the story i'm, I'm not trying to give <laughs> my cv uh so i did a uh, math and computer science you know at a top university then i did an mba so you know uh, in, in my mba i i did a thesis in operations mm. research which is the field of applied mathematics so I had a serious background and I was heading on to now do my PhD. And uh, one of the places I had been accepted to for my PhD was University of California, Irvine. So I had gone to visit there. And it turns out that I have a brother who lived in Southern California, who who's much older than me, who was very keen on ha having me work with him for a few years. You know, uh, his younger brother, we can do big things together. And so he was trying to convince me to take a break after my MBA, work with him for a few years. And then, you know, I can go back and do my PhD, which I really wasn't interested in, but that's what he was trying to do. Uh, when my mother got caught news of the fact that my brother was trying to convince me to 
to not pursue my PhD for a few years. So when I returned to Montreal, she takes me to a side room and I'm thinking, wow, this is serious. She's, I want to talk to you. I said, what, what's up, mom? She said, well, I'm hearing that uh, you're thinking of uh, not doing your PhD. Uh, you, do you want people to say that you are somebody who dropped out of school? So now imagine... This is PhD. Um, this is a this PhD. Is PhD. Yes. So if I leave after an MBA, I will be bringing huge shame because people will remember me as somebody who dropped out of school, right? Now, of course... As I tell people, it's not as though I pursued my PhD to make my mother happy. Of course not. But it shows you the punishing standard of excellence that is inculcated. Because oftentimes people ask me, well, what, what's the mystery of the Jewish people? Why are they so successful? In some cases, it could almost be anti-Semitic because they think that there's kind of like a diabolical Jewish you know, cabal happening. And I don't get into the genetic stuff, right? I just say, look, when you come from a culture of excellence, like the one, the story that I just said, how could you not succeed when you have that kind of expectation placed on you? And the famous James Flynn, you know, the one who attributed all in uh, you, the, the father of Flynn or Lean Flynn effect, the, sure. you know, that IQ scores uh, rises with, rise with time, say in a recent, in one of his last interviews, that there is a very a, a profound difference in, a black families and Jewish families within the U.S. If a black mother th see her, her boy on television, you know, from the NFL or some league, wow, this is great, he is on television. But if a Jewish mother, and S James Flynn said it in his own words, if a Jewish mother sees her boy on television, she will be devastated. <laughs> Well, do you, know, do you know the joke at the, you, you must have heard this joke, but maybe some of your viewers haven't. I, I hope I don't screw it up. But it's a, a, a mother is sitting there while her son is being inaugurated as the first American Jewish <laughs> president, right? And and so she turns to the person sitting next to him and she goes, you know that my other son is a doctor, huh? Uh, so so she wasn't impressed with the guy who was the president of the United States. Yeah. She had to show off that her son is a, is a doctor. So that speaks to the the, the pathological yes. pursuit of, of knowledge in the Jewish tradition. God, I value so much your time. I have so many questions, including two questions from ChatGPT, which I think they are great. But I value your time and I promise you 45 minutes. So uh, first, thank you so much for your time. This was like an mind-blowing in interview Thank i always sir. ask my guest two questions one sure. can you recommend a book that you read in the last five or ten years that just change your perspective on life last five or ten years i'm trying to it it, it won't be in the last five or ten years okay. i could i could recommend a book uh, because the one that changed my perspective the most is the one that set me off on my evolutionary psychology career it's a uh, book that I read also in my first semester at Cornell, but not with Dick Thaler. It was in a course with the professor Dennis Regan, who's a social psychologist. And about halfway through the semester, he assigned a book called Homicide uh, by Margot Wilson and Martin Daly, who are the husband and wife team, two of the pioneers of evolutionary psychology. And in the book, what they do is they look at patterns of criminality from across the world and across time periods. And they demonstrate that there are certain universal, certain regularities that happen precisely for evolutionary reasons. And therefore their application of the, uh, yeah, there, there it is, that's the one, thank you. So their application of the evolutionary lens to explain all these patterns of criminality completely blew my mind. I couldn't believe the explanatory power that the evolutionary lens was affording. And that's when I had the epiphany. Aha, I will use exactly this evolutionary lens to study psychology of decision-making, consumer psychology, economic decision-making. So that would probably be the book that uh, from, an, I could, from, from my scientific career was by far the most influential. Another book that was very influential for when I wrote The Parasitic Mind is a book by two uh, well professors, 
uh, I think it was uh, Gross and Levitt. You can you can put that one up if you want as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it, yeah. It's called High, Higher Superstition. And it's a book that was written in the 1990s that was warning the world about all of the nonsense that was starting to, you know, be proliferating across academia. And when I read that book, I was like, oh boy, yes, that's exactly the book. Perfect. That's exactly one. One is a biologist. The other one is a mathematician. And that's another book that, you know, 20 plus years ago started germinating my thinking about the eventual book that I would write, The Parasitic Mind. Germinating my thinking. And last question, do you have one productivity tip because you achieve so much, you write so much, you you know the status. I have my own podcast. I know how difficult, how challenging it is. You must be fully prepared. Just one productivity tip. Uh, so it's going to be sort of two, if you don't mind. Forgive me for not adhering to your thing. Number one, it's a, and actually this is something that I discuss in the, in my forthcoming book. I have a chapter called Life as a Playground. Uh, that even the most serious things that we do, whether we're pursuing science, even when you're going through the Holocaust, there are children who were playing in the most dire of circumstances. So one of the reasons why I am so productive is because I have a childlike love for everything. So, you know, I'm speaking to you. I, I do have to go, but yet I'm enjoying my thing. I'm a child. I'm having fun. I just met a new person. We're discussing ideas. So... I wake up every morning and I rub my hands at the incredible possibilities that are going to happen this day. And therefore, that's one thing that allows me to be productive because I'm always thinking, what's the next cool thing that I can create? So that's part one, childlike love of play. Number two is then to have the discipline to see that through. You can't write a book within the time window that the publishers give you, especially when you start becoming a you know more known academic or author, they give you a lot of money for the book advance. So there is a gun to your head that's saying, I better receive the book by September 26. There is no way you're going to meet that deadline if you don't have a pathological discipline. It doesn't matter if I'm tired. It doesn't matter if I had a problem at home. It doesn't matter if a student was obnoxious. It doesn't matter if I have bronchitis and I can't breathe. I am going to write 500 words each day, no matter what. So child, childlike love of life coupled with pathological discipline hopefully leads to productivity. God, Saad, thank you so much. I would like to conclude this interview by wishing myself to speak with you again about your latest book, The Sad Truth About Happiness. I would, I would be happy to do it again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. On this channel, you will see the authors of these books and many more having great conversations with me. Please subscribe, hit the bell button, and be part of this great community. See you in the next video.